Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. There's nothing uncertain about the importance of two events, the crucifixion and the resurrection. Obviously, Messiah being crucified is why he was sent into this world. Because of God's great love for you and me and all of humanity, we see that God sent his son in order that he would do the work of redemption, that he would secure for us forgiveness of our sins, that through the cross, God would offer to all of humanity his grace in order that we could experience eternal salvation. And the resurrection, when we look at this event theologically, we see that although the Bible says that Messiah, he laid down his life, no one took it from him, and he had the power to take it up again, he did not. Yeshua, that is Jesus of Nazareth, was always submissive. He laid down his life, and it was God his Father. The scripture says this in numerous places. It was God the Father who raised up God the Son from the dead. And this serves as a testimony to you and to me, to all people, that God received the work of Yeshua completely. He deemed it perfect, sufficient, in order to accomplish the purpose of God. And what was that? Well, we find that Messiah just didn't die, but he was hung upon the tree. And why is that important? Well, I have shared this before. Because the Torah says in the book of Deuteronomy, cursed is the one who's hung upon the tree. That means that Messiah took, when he died, he took the curse of the law, that no longer are we who believe in him under the judgment of the law, but we have been forgiven. He took the punishment of the law, the death and the curse, that we might be individuals that walk faithfully and receive life and also the blessing that comes from walking in faith. That is the good news. Now, there's one other very important truth that we want to talk about before we begin. We see that although we are not under the law, the law still has relevance. The law still teaches us what is righteous and what is unrighteous. And now through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, you and I, through the Spirit teaching us, we can take the truth of the law, apply God's intent in that law to our life, again, being led by the Spirit, that we might be people, as Paul says in Romans chapter 8 and verse 4, that we who walk not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, that we might fulfill the righteousness of the law. And once again, it is that work, that ministry of the Holy Spirit, that makes this all possible for every believer. Well, take out your Bible and look with me to the book of Matthew and chapter 27. The book of Matthew and chapter 27. Now, the focus of this week, we saw that Yeshua was crucified last week, but that only began that process. And this week and also next week, we'll see that he's still upon the tree. He has not yet died. He is being crucified. And we want to see the important events that surrounded his crucifixion. So again, Matthew chapter 25, and we're going to begin with verse 36. Now he has been crucified. He has been nailed to that tree. And we read in verse 36, and sitting down, 
they were keeping him there now keeping means keeping watch guarding him and the subject of this sentence is the roman guards they were there the ones who crucified him and then perhaps others they set a watch upon him in order that they would watch him die then they would bury him and secure as we're going to see the tomb in order that no one would take his body so there were those guards who were watching him there and notice something else we read in verse 37 and they placed above his head his indictment that is the the accusation that was against him but it literally says his accusation meaning what he was crucified for what was his crime what does the word of god reveal concerning why the roman empire crucified yeshua again verse 37 and they placed above his head his accusation having been written and this is what it says this is yeshua that is jesus the king of the jews now we've learned a few times in our study of matthew that this term the king of the jews is a messianic description if we wanted to use another word instead of messiah or christ from the greek the synonym for christ is king the word anointed or or christos has to do with just that anointing one and in this context it's the anointing of the king we're speaking about the king of god's kingdom his only begotten son and what did he come into this world to do to give his life as a propitiation that is a gift in order that sin would be eradicated blotted out taken away removed so there would be no reason for god's judgment that punishment of the torah to be placed upon us so once again his indictment was this is yeshua the king of the jews now in another gospel we know that the jewish leadership did not want this to be written at all but why is it written in this way to reveal to us it was the the conclusion of the roman empire that this yeshua jesus is indeed the messiah this was the official ruling and why he was crucified he was crucified because he is the messiah and why would this need to be the case well prophetically and prophecy is so important prophetically it had to be the case because one of the calls of the messiah is to be that suffering servant to give his life as a redemption for many to lay down his life in order that we would receive forgiveness and have eternal life so this indictment being placed over his head has great significance now verse 38 then were crucified with him two thieves one on his right and one on the left now this fulfills what we read in another very important prophecy i'm speaking about isaiah chapter 53 where it says there in verse 12 that he was numbered with the transgressors meaning that he who knew no sin he was perfect he never violated any of the commandments of god nevertheless he who was without sin he became sin in our behalf meaning this our sins were placed upon him my guiltiness my shame my transgressions iniquities and every aspect of sinfulness was laid upon him and not just mine but the scripture says the sins of the world in order that all people could be saved experience this forgiveness but it demands one thing faith in accepting believing that that death upon that cross what we're speaking of his crucifixion is indeed 
the payment in full for eternity for all the sins of the world. This is what Messiah achieved. This is why he was anointed. He was sent into this world. So we read here, then were crucified with him two thieves, one on the right and one on the left. Verse 39. And the ones who were passing by. Now, one of the things that is so significant is grammar, changes in grammar. And we see in this section that we're studying right now, a new grammatical construction appears and it's the imperfect tense and what was that well that shows us and it's in regard to the verb they were blasphemy now this is significant because blasphemy points out his identity blasphemy is against god this is another way the biblical text is telling us that yeshua is not just fully man he is fully man but eternally he is God, the Son of God, fully divine. And I want to emphasize that. And let me just point out to you that if you do not believe in the divinity of Messiah, you are without hope. You cannot be saved if you deny his divinity. Why is that? Because you don't know his identity. You have not accepted the biblical Messiah. So his divinity is very important, and there's an evidence of that because it says, look again at verse 39. And the ones that were passing by, they were blaspheming him. And what's significant is this. They were doing that, but there's going to be a change. There's going to be a change in the world's recognition of who Yeshua is. Now, what verse am I speaking about? Philippians chapter 2, where it says that every tongue will confess and every knee will bow to the glory of God, that Yeshua HaMashiach, that Jesus Christ, that he is Lord. So this blasphemy is going to come to an end and there's going to be a recognition that he is indeed Messiah, the Son of the living God the savior of humanity. But those people who will eventually confess and bow the knee concerning his lordship, if you do that after you die, and the majority of humanity is going to do that, they're going to be forced to recognize. For example, at the great white throne judgment, they're going to know he is Lord of Lords, King of Kings, but it's too late for them. They have died, the Bible says, it's appointed to all people, every individual, to die once and after that, the judgment. So they're going to experience eternal judgment because they did not recognize him. In this age, they were blaspheming him. And it says that they were wagging their heads. This is a, a sign, an idiom for, for disgust and contempt. They were blaspheming him and they had contempt wagging their heads at him and then they were saying look now to verse 40 and they were saying the one who destroys the sanctuary and on three days i will build it now this is something that that was said in regard to his trial before the sanhedrin because he taught he says i will destroy the temple and in three days, build it again. Now, what was he referring to? He was referring to the spiritual aspect of that statement. Because the body is a sanctuary of the Holy Spirit. And he was saying, I'm going to die. This body, his body, Yeshua's body, is going to die. But three days later, I'm going to rise from the dead. And the point here he was speaking about this important event, the resurrection. God confirmed everything Messiah said as true. Everything he did as righteous, as proper, especially this giving of himself, this laying down of his life. So it's to remind us of what he said that he's going to do. He was going to die. 
His body was going to be destroyed when he's crucified, but he was going to rise again. But they didn't understand that. Why? Because they were emphasizing the physical rather than the spiritual. They looked at things when he said temple, the temple in Jerusalem, rather than understanding he was speaking about the temple of his body. So they were quoting that, this statement, that he was going to die in three days, rise again, and he said, they were saying, save yourself if the Son of God you are. If you're the Son of God, save yourselves. Now realize, if he were to do this, and we're going to see it repeated again in a moment, if he were to do this, he would be disobeying his Father, disobeying God's plan for salvation. It was just not enough for him to be crucified. He's still alive. But he had to be crucified and die. He had to be that, that sacrifice for our sin. He had to shed his blood, dying, in order to make this eternal redemption for you and me. So they were trying to get him to do that which was against his father's plan, against why he was sent into this world. So once again, we read in the middle of verse 40, they were saying, save yourself if you are the son of God. Come down now from the cross. That's what they wanted. They wanted him not to complete the work that he was sent into this world to do. So they were saying, come down from the cross. Likewise, verse 41, and likewise also the Pharisees were, and this is what they were doing, they were mocking. Likewise also the Pharisees with the scribes and the elders, they were mocking and they were saying, now verse 42, others he saved, himself he's not able to save. Well, he's able, but this was not God's will. This is another great example of Yeshua always being faithful to the Father's plan, the Father's purpose. Now let's pause for a moment. I always like to try to find personal application from the text. Now this is a course about Yeshua, not about you and me, but we can learn from his example. And here's the point. It doesn't matter what other people say they will do. We need to be faithful to what God tells us to do. The response of others isn't our objective. Our objective is being faithful to God, doing what he calls us to do, accomplishing the plan for our life. And it doesn't matter what other people say, say they will do, say they won't do. None of that is important. Oftentimes, it's this proclamation, this saying, that is, is moving us away from what God wants us to be and from what God wants us to do. So if he would have obeyed them, taken significance in their statement, and been misled by saying, well, if I come down, they're going to believe me, that's good. No, what's good is this. Not what people say, but you being obedient to what God tells you to do. So they were saying, look again at verse 42, Others he saved. Himself he's not able to save. If the king of Israel you are, come down now. Now this is the second time we've seen this. Now, a word of urgency. Because these individuals, whether they intended or not, whether they realized it or not, they were being used by the enemy. The enemy, and I'm speaking about Satan, is always, always, always against the purposes of God. And therefore, they were saying, come down now. He was sent into this world to die. This was the purpose that he came this moment on Passover day, the preparation day. He was doing the work of redemption. He had to die. But they were saying, if you are the king of Israel, Come down now from the cross and we will believe him. If you are the king of Israel, if this is the case, come down now and we will believe you. Well, that was a lie. They had no intention of believing him. 
They had no desire to submit to God. In fact, what they were doing showed two things. A failure to understand God's prophetic plan, that he was that suffering servant. And secondly, they were about getting him away from the will of God. That's what Satan is. Satan hates the will of God. Satan isn't interested in the will of God. He's about his desire what he thinks his destiny is and here's the problem there are many people today who call themselves believers and perhaps they are god knows but the problem is this they want their will they have been misled see this word destiny i believe it's a dangerous word it confuses people you know what's a better word the will of god that's what's good god's will we want god's will when we start talking about our destiny you know what happens it 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 arouses our our pride it usually has to do with what we think we have coming to us what we want what we think would be right for us this is not not god's will we have to have it revealed to us so they were saying come down now from the cross and we will believe him verse 43 they continue mocking trying to get him away from the will of god and they say in verse 43 he trusted in god let him deliver him now if he delights if he delights in him so they're saying now god if if this is really your son if you really are well pleased with him as was was prophesied and proclaimed at the jordan river and also at at the mount of transfiguration if this is the case then you have to deliver him no god does not have to meet our expectations the expectations of humanity which usually those are sinful expectations god's will is not for him to rescue him god sent him into this world for this purpose so we read in verse 43 he trusted in god let him meaning let god now rescue him if he delights in him verse 44 for he said now they're quoting messiah this is important because so many times i've been speaking at places and someone will ask me a question and they'll say it this way they'll say you know, Yeshua never claimed to be the Son of God. That's false. There are numerous, numerous places where Him being the Son of God is spoken of. And here's one. It says right here. And these are the Pharisees, the scribes, the high priests, the elders, this group of leadership. They understand. For He said that I am the Son of God. They're quoting what He said. And this is true. He acknowledged where? Well, one place is at that trial. Just that, that evening before, few hours before he was crucified, when, when the high priest Caiaphas went to him and said, I, I adjourn you, meaning I implore you. I want you to take an oath before me and tell me if you are the son of the blessed one, the most high God. And Yeshua confirmed and he said, not only that, but you'll see me coming in the clouds of, of heaven. If you notice that context in Daniel chapter 7, this speaks about his divinity. So he says, yes, he is the son of God. Verse, 20, uh, verse 44, excuse me. Also, like this, were the thieves that were crucified with him they were also and this is a word for reproach they were railing against him reproaching him and i want us to conclude with one more verse verse 45. verse 45 is such an important verse and when i talk about the jewish context of scripture what i'm talking about is understanding the the backgrounds of the bible the biblical backgrounds for the bible so we get a fuller and accurate meaning of what's happening 
Now, when we look at this last verse we're going to study in, in tonight's message, notice that it says in verse 45, it begins with the phrase. It's the second word of the text, but it's always translated first. And it is the word, the conjunction, but, in contrast. Now, it's not the word in, but, in contrast to these elders, these high priests, these, these scribes, the, the thieves, and others mocking him and being against the will of God. In contrast to that, we see something in our last verse tonight, something very significant. Look at that with me, verse 45. From the sixth hour, darkness happened. It became dark from the sixth hour, that is noontime. From the sixth hour, over all the earth, it became dark until the ninth hour hour now that is highly important why well first of all from noon until approximately three when he died darkness covered the earth why is that important well if you look in the book of exodus we see something it was at midnight darkness that god struck in order that the jewish people the children of israel and that mixed multitude went forth and from this, we learn a principle that God's redemption happens in darkness. This was what was taught by the sages, that there is a connection between darkness and redemption. So now, when it should have been the brightest, this is in the springtime. The sun is high, it's noontime. But what happens? God, in contrast to the people mocking him, putting him down, in contrast to that, God did something. God caused, it's a miracle, for there to be darkness because darkness relates theologically to redemption. Why? Messiah is that light that shines in darkness. He's the light of the world. So redemption, what it tells us is that Messiah died upon that cross at that ninth hour nine being work six being grace he did the work of grace in order for the world to experience redemption so the question we have to conclude with is this have you experienced this redemption by accepting his death upon the cross believing that not only did he die but also god the father confirming receiving his death he raised him from the dead speaking about the life that you and I can receive by faith. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel.